pollen levels for the next few weeks. The difference this year is that we've had a sudden, almost overnight, increase in pollen levels, especially grass pollen. The reason we get summer storms. The resultant clap of thunder is audible evidence of this electrical attraction and the immense energy released from the storm. And drawing up a risk assessment for climate change. With a hotter climate, especially with dry summers, we can expect more severe fire weather in the UK. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the weather headlines. The UK government is required to publish a climate change risk assessment, or CCRA, every five years. The report is informed by an independent assessment that sets out the risks and opportunities posed by climate change. The latest assessment, CCRA 3, was released this week and to find out more, climate correspondent Graham Madge spoke to Professor Richard Betts, contributing author and head of climate impacts research here at the Met Office. Richard, you've been closely involved with this report. What aspects of climate change does it cover? So the report covers all aspects of climate change. So it covers the impacts of climate change in the UK, it covers impacts of climate change elsewhere in the world which affect the UK, so changes in uh, extreme weather, uh, changes in the background climate state, and it's looking at both changes that have already happened, changes that we are committed to even if we meet the terms of the Paris Agreement by limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. We're also looking at future global warming of up to four degrees by the end of this century, which could happen on our current trajectory. What are the most immediate risks for the UK and how have those risks increased since the last report was produced? So the most immediate risks uh, are to do with extreme weather, which has already increased or become more likely in recent years. So in particular, there's high temperatures. We've had heat waves in recent years, which have been shown to have been made more likely because of climate change, uh, which have caused, sadly, deaths. So we are seeing the impacts of uh, climate change occurring through high temperatures already. Heavy rainfall has also been shown to be made more likely due to climate change. We've had some unprecedented heavy rainfall events, and that leads through to a wide variety of impacts, uh, such as flooding in many forms. One particular impact which became clear during the process of producing this report was heavy rainfall causing landslides on coal tips in Wales. When Storm Dennis hit last year, there was a landslide at one such coal tip, which fortunately did not impact on any people directly, but it did bring home the fact that there are many of these tips there which need to be investigated. Now, indeed, they were urgently investigated, and it was identified that many of them are actually at, at high risk. So now the challenge is to deal with those and make them safe. And of course, the question is, how urgent is this? because of climate change. Rainfall has got heavier, so it may have increased the risk of these things happening again. Longer term, what are the risks that we should consider, including perhaps impacts that we've not even seen yet? So one long term impact is sea level rise. Sea levels are already rising. But the reason this is a long term impact is because it takes a long time for the oceans to fully respond to climate change in terms of sea level rise because the uh, melting of ice on land, which puts more water into the oceans to cause sea level rise, that takes a long time to happen. Glaciers take decades or centuries to fully respond to a level of warming, and it takes a while for the heat to penetrate into the deep ocean and expand the water as it warms. So we're already committed to more sea level rise, even if we were to stop global warming at current levels. So that's a long-term impact, which is already in the pipeline. But if we continue to emit more greenhouse gases and cause more warming, then, of course, sea level rise will be even more severe in the longer term. Professor Richard Betts, and we'll return to that conversation a little later on. After a quiet start to the pollen season, this week has seen very high grass pollen levels across England and Wales, making life uncomfortable for many hay fever sufferers. So how are pollen levels likely to continue in coming weeks? Here's Yolanda Clulo. I'm Yolanda Clulo and I am the Relationship Manager for Health and Air Quality Services and Research at the Met Office. Part of that role is I manage the UK pollen network and forecasting capability. 
So this year, the pollen season is fairly average and some of you may have been suffering quite significant symptoms and that maybe doesn't tally with that fact. But I think the difference this year to many other years is that we've had a sudden almost overnight increase in pollen levels, especially grass pollen. So we've gone from very low levels, single figures and low double figures, to in the hundreds of pollen grains in the atmosphere per cubic metre. So I think that's what people are maybe registering this year, is that dramatic, rapid increase in levels. And that's because the initial start to the summer was quite cold and wet. We had predominant westerly weather systems. And then we dramatically shifted to a more dry, warm system. And overnight, the pollen that was poised, ready to be released, was able to be blown off the plants into dry, warm air. So anyone with an allergy to pollen grass, pollen, was suddenly exposed to very high levels. So another interesting phenomenon that we've been monitoring much more closely in the last few years is the phenomenon of thunderstorm asthma that some of you may have heard of. And this is a phenomenon experienced quite dramatically in Australia in 2016. A, a suite of storms swept across the south of Australia, coupled with very high pollen levels. And there was a dramatic increase in admissions to hospital and ambulance call outs. People were experiencing extreme symptoms and asthma attacks. The exact mechanisms as to why this causes dramatic increases in respiratory problems isn't well understood. So with Public Health England and others, we are working closely to try and identify periods when there are increased asthma admissions. There's all sorts of mechanisms that may be involved. It could be lightning, for example, bursting the pollen grains open and releasing the smaller, very allergenic grains within, and they can get much deeper inside the lungs. It could be something called osmotic burst, which is the water content forcing the pollen grains to burst open. There's also ionic charge. The change in the electrical charge within a storm can switch conditions so quickly that the pollen grains burst again. So there's lots of different things we're looking at. In the longer term, we are seeing changes to the pollen season. The evidence is showing that this extending season, the earlier starts in particular, is due to climate change. Another consequence of climate change is that we will start to see more invasive plants take hold and become established in this country. Species that are already prevalent in other countries. As our climate warms, we will see these species become more embedded and take off in this country. Some are already here. They're in very small pockets, but they will start to take hold. Um, and the season is getting more intense as well. So these are significant for people that are already suffering. I'm afraid the news isn't great in the longer term. After the recent spell of very warm, sunny weather, some parts of the country have experienced thunder and lightning over the past few days. But how do summer conditions give rise to stormy weather? Here with an explanation, Head and Roberts. It's quite common during the summer months to see what we call a thundery breakdown after some muggy days. In fact, it's often said that a British summer is three fine days followed by a thunderstorm. This past week, hot air from the near continent has intensified and extended northwards, resulting in hot weather across the UK, especially in the southeast. This heat has been accompanied by humid conditions, that's air that contains a large amount of water vapour. High temperatures and high humidity are just two of the ingredients necessary for the development of thunderstorms. The lower atmosphere also needs to be unstable where warm air near the surface sits underneath much colder air aloft. This allows air to surge upwards into the colder layer, where water vapour condenses into small droplets, forming cumulus clouds. With enough of a temperature contrast through a significant depth of the atmosphere and fuelled by air loaded with water vapour, water droplets combine to create larger droplets, which freeze to form ice crystals and quite soon hail. A circulation of strengthening updrafts and downdrafts produces strong gusty winds. The violent movement of hail in these now mature cumulonimbus clouds creates negative charges which are discharged to earth or between clouds in the form of lightning. 
The resultant clap of thunder is audible evidence of this electrical attraction and the immense energy released from the storm. While the UK has seen a few homegrown storms this week, it's also inherited thunderstorms from Iberia and France. Mid-level winds at around 10 to 14,000 feet, having steered these towards the UK. The result has been a lively combination of torrential rain, thunder, lightning, hail and strong gusty winds. Senior meteorologist Helen Roberts. So, have we seen the end of the recent thunderstorms? Here with the outlook for the next few days, Ada McGiven. Further thunderstorms are expected in some places during this weekend and the start of next week. More on that in the moment, but actually Friday's thunderstorms during Friday evening should largely clear away from East Anglia and the southeast. Many places turning drier then overnight. A lot of cloud remaining, but where we do get clear spells towards the north and the west, it will be a cool start to the weekend. It's in the north and the west where there will be the best chance of some sunny spells early Saturday. And then elsewhere, some low cloud to begin things, but that should lift. Things should brighten up quite quickly by the afternoon. And then for many, actually Saturday is looking like the best day of the weekend. Sunny spells, just the odd shower developing in western Scotland, northwest England, perhaps north Wales as well. Otherwise, for many, it's a dry day. And it will feel pleasant in any sunny spells, certainly feeling warmer in the southeast compared to Friday with temperatures reaching the low 20s. But further thunderstorms are going to develop over the continent and they are expected to drift northwards, reaching southern parts of England during late afternoon and early evening on Saturday. And then they'll become more widespread across much of England and Wales overnight. These will be hit and miss, but where they do occur, they could be very lively indeed. Scotland and Northern Ireland, though, should get off to a dry start on Sunday with sunny spells and just the odd shower through the day. Elsewhere, across England and Wales, further showers and thunderstorms or even longer spells of rain will develop on Sunday. These outbreaks of rain and showers will be very hit and miss, so highly variable weather from place to place, but it looks more unsettled, certainly compared to Saturday. And that theme continues into the start of next week. England and Wales will see some quite lively weather at times with showers and thunderstorms by midweek. It looks like temperatures will dip below average, but it will be a little quieter with mainly sunny spells and a few showers expected. Thanks, Aidan. Earlier, we heard Professor Richard Betts talking about the wide-ranging impacts of climate change highlighted in the current UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. Here he is again, this time talking about a climate risk more usually associated with hotter countries. One of the emergent risks to the UK is wildfire. We do have fires in the UK, but they're nowhere near as severe as we see in other parts of the world. But with a hotter climate, especially with drier summers, we can expect more severe fire weather in the UK. So, so the key thing there will be to make sure that we are more prepared for that weather and don't allow large-scale wildfires to happen by changing our behaviour, making sure we don't accidentally set off fires, and also by learning to live with them more, perhaps not having properties in exposed areas, because we're, we're just not kind of attuned to that kind of problem at the moment. So we need to think in a different way and think what kind of extremes of weather we could be exposed to in the future as well as now. There's a lot of effort going on to try and cut greenhouse gas emissions. But what you're saying is that we need to learn how to adapt. Having to live with the climate change that is already happening and already in the pipeline. So as well as mitigation, adaptation is, uh, is needed as well. And the difference between those is that mitigation is reducing uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. It's about stopping further climate change. Adaptation is about living with the climate change which is already happening or already in the pipeline and it's not a choice between the two uh, because certain a certain amount of climate change is already underway we have to live with that we have to adapt to that so we have to mitigate and adapt and we need to do both urgently uh, because we need to rapidly make cuts in greenhouse gases to avoid the worst impacts of climate change in the longer term but we also need to put in place urgent adaptation measures to make sure we're more resilient to the climate change that is already happening. Professor Richard Betts talking there to climate correspondent Graham Madge and you can find out more details on the latest UK climate risk assessment at ukclimaterisk.org. 
Well, after high pollen levels, lightning strikes and the risks posed by climate change, let's end, as always, with the soothing tones of Martin Bowles. It's last week's highs and lows. Here are the highs and lows for last week, recorded between Monday the 7th of June and Sunday the 13th of June. During a warm, summery week for many, the highest air temperature was at Heathrow Airport on Sunday, when 28.0 Celsius was recorded. There had been speculation that a strange record would be broken, that 30 Celsius would be recorded on a June the 13th for the first time since records began. Sure enough, that odd statistic continues for yet another year. 30 Celsius has been reached on every other date of meteorological summer. The lowest air temperature last week was plus 0.9 Celsius at Tindrum in Perthshire early on Monday morning. The sunniest place was Weybourne in Norfolk, which recorded 15.7 hours on Sunday. Many areas had very little rain last week, but 18.4 mm was measured at Atnagart in Rossencromarty on Wednesday. Thanks, Martin. That's it for this week's edition of Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.